we're going to continue uh, our commentary on Mark. Uh, we left off talking about John the Baptist uh, and Josephus. For those who don't know, Josephus is a, a Jewish historian, very important source for uh, the history of uh, the Maccabee period and the period of, of the first century with uh, with Jesus and, and then the, the war of the Jews against the Romans that began in 66 uh, AD or CE uh, and then Masada in 73 the destruction of the temple in 70 and Josephus lives uh, you know, a decade or two more um, so he's a little later than Jesus but roughly contemporary and um, he writes about, as I said, Jesus and John the Baptist in that order. First, Jesus, a small blurb. As I recall from one of the great scholars of Josephus, Steve Mason, uh, he says that uh, Josephus is narrating all these hustle and bustle, almost like a, an oriental bazaar full of life and, and noise and all of a sudden he has this like hiatus this brief uh, sort of entry into some door where you're in a quiet place and he talks about Jesus it's famous that the the passage has been interpolated by Christian copyists uh, so that you have additions there that are not from Josephus regarding Jesus but um, I think the scholars are agreed that what he does say about Jesus is extremely respectful. And he talks about how his disciples, after he had died, did not you know, forget him, but still venerate him, etc. Uh, and, um, you know, we don't have to say much more than that um, uh, to get into a discussion of Josephus. But the important thing is that in Josephus, there is no connection between John the Baptist and Jesus. So later, uh, when he talks about John the Baptist, I think we're talking about the War of the Jews. He's got two great works, The Antiquities of the Jews, multi-volume, extensive history of Israel, and then The War of the Jews that you know, he began in 66, uh, Common Era, A.D., he was a general in Galilee, and uh, he surrendered and became very friendly with Titus and the Flavian dynasty. So he took the name Flavius Josephus, and he had like a writing grant in, in Rome to uh, write like a you know resident scholar. And he's addressing Romans who uh, are favorably disposed to Jews and trying to explain why uh, this war arose against Rome, which was a crazy war. Rome, of course, crushed uh, the, the Jews and destroyed the temple. It wasn't the last time the Jews would rise up against Rome, but in any case, uh, he's trying to explain that the Jews are no more rebellious than any other people when they have bad government, etc. What he says about John the Baptist is, is interesting. He says that John the Baptist was a prophet, uh, considered as such by the people, who hung on his every word and were ready to obey him uh, implicitly. And so that Herod Antipas decided to make a preemptive strike and get rid of him. So really, uh, it's a politically uh, relevant uh, person. And uh, what Herod was concerned about was precisely uh, a, a prophet figure who uh, could stir up the people to rebellion. Of course, you know, if you, if you see what uh, John the Baptist preaches, uh, especially in, in the Matthew and Luke accounts, which I think contains some very old uh, tradition about John the Baptist, uh, the famous Q source, which is a source that is used by Matthew and Luke, but not Mark. And it's very, uh, goes back to Jesus. Uh, 
a large part. He talks about, you know, the axe is laid to the root. Every tree that doesn't give fruit will be cut down, etc., convert, all these things. And, um, and so he was a fiery sort of brimstone uh, and sulfur kind of prophet uh, conversion. And, um, and so he was removed because of this, so that the account in Mark that's very famous that Herod threw a banquet and uh, his stepdaughter, I guess, uh, Salome, danced and pleased him so much he offered her half his kingdom, kind of like the king in Esther offers Esther half his kingdom. It's a sort of a huge uh, token of appreciation. Uh, that story um, is 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 in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, the historicity of that we would have to uh, be cautious about. What we can say about Mark, and it should be said straight away, is that he certainly downplays the political aspects of the whole story he's narrating. Uh, I don't get too much into who wrote Mark and where it was written, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable to uh, accept a, a strong tradition that it was written in Rome. I think probably written before 70, but many scholars believe it was written in, in 70, or even after that, which means the temple was already destroyed. I, I think he, he doesn't quite know about the destruction of the temple. And uh, certainly in, in the late 60s, you have this Nero's fire, which uh, was a great persecution of Christians being blamed for this fire. And there's a passage in Mark that all of you will be salted with fire. And so uh, you may even have an echo of, of this persecution. So the last thing he wants is to um, put fuel into the fire of who this Jesus is. It's bad enough he's been crucified by the Romans, which is a political penalty. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about Jesus as king very much. He doesn't mention Bethlehem or, or David uh, as Jesus, son of David. I mean, he's the Lord of David. There's that episode uh, where Jesus discusses Psalm 110, uh, the Messiah is David's Lord, not the son of David. The entry into Jerusalem, uh, instead of being acclaimed as king, as in the Gospel of uh, John, they uh, acclaim the kingdom that comes from our father David, so that Jesus as king is avoided. Another interesting passage is, uh, you'll recall that usually people remember that the mother of the Zebedee brothers came to ask Jesus that her sons sit at his right and left in his kingdom. But in the Mark version, it doesn't say in his kingdom. It says in his glory, in your glory. And it's not the mother. It's the, the Zebedee uh, brothers themselves who want to sit next to Jesus in his glory. So again, the... Um, the kingdom political aspect of what Jesus did uh, is, is played down. And I think perhaps even the pilot reluctance to condemn Jesus is, is something that Mark uh, starts to distance the Romans from involvement in Jesus' condemnation and execution, even though he, he was crucified and, and, and Christian creed says, crucified under Pontius Pilate, and say, killed by the Jews. Uh, and, and, and in Mark, it says that Pilate realized they were, um, you know, out of envy, uh, wanting him dead, etc. And, and I think in all four Gospels, you have this very unusual uh, episode with Barabbas, who at a symbolic level, is very significant. Um, Barabbas, which is an Aramaic name that means son of the father, is a true revolutionary, and you might say a false son of the father. And he's chosen by the people, instead of Jesus, the true son of the father, and a false 
falsely accused revolutionary. So you've got that um, interesting episode and this custom of releasing a prisoner during Passover is quite debated among the scholars. So uh, I'm giving you a taste of the kind of composition that goes into these Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, which is the one we're dealing with, to present a, a, a message uh, that has a kernel of history for sure, but again, uh, as we said in one of the introductory sessions, it's like a pill with active ingredients, which is the real teaching, but delivered with inactive ingredients because there's no other way to, to have a, an effective medicine. Uh, I said that the Jews have the Haggadah, which is the story, and then the Halakha, which are the ethical or legal consequences contained in the story. And, and, and that the ancient reader, and I think many Jews would say, it's not so much what really happened, but what does this mean to me, and what am I supposed to do having heard this teaching? And so I think that it's a good rule of thumb when we uh, look at these Gospels. Uh, I'm a practicing Catholic. I'm a firm believer. I try to be. And so the synthesis of how to uh, understand this, you know, not being a fundamentalist that takes everything literally in the wrong way. I think every word and even dot is important, but you have to understand what it's trying to say. And so John the Baptist uh, was this a uh, preacher prophet. I think uh, we can look at him as the reawakening of prophecy after 400 years of, of silence and of God not um, speaking or doing anything until the last days when then he's expected to reawaken and begin uh, the redemptive work in the final age. Uh, Jesus is sleeping in the boat. They wake him up. In Isaiah 51, verse 9, they ask Yahweh to wake up his arm and repeat the portents he had done in the beginning when he slew these sea you know, monsters and, and freed the people through the, dead, uh, the Red Sea in, in Egypt, etc. So that John the Baptist is, is the awakening of this prophecy. And Jesus went to be baptized by him. Some scholars posit that he was a disciple of John the Baptist, learned from John the Baptist, broke away with a different program from John the, John the Baptist, uh, revered John the Baptist as no, no one born of woman has been greater than John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. In other words, two different eras. John is the, at the end of one era, and Jesus is in the beginning of the other era. Luke has a, a wonderful verse on that. In Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets uh, are until John. And from then, the, uh, king, the good news of the kingdom of God begins to be proclaimed. And everyone with, tries to enter it violently, etc. A very mysterious phrase. Of course, in, in the Gospel of Luke, John the Baptist preaches the good news. So... Uh, we're looking at each gospel individually, in this case, Mark. And um, But um, whether, you know, he was a disciple or, or, or just got baptized, uh, did a humble act, perhaps, joining the people to be baptized with a baptism of conversion, uh, I think then we can uh, seg into what happened at the baptism. And here we get into a theological interpretation of history. Uh, every historian is going to have his bias and believe that his bias, or maybe a priori uh, presumptions that are not subject to experience, he just believes that. Um, he could deny many things on the basis of faith. Uh, we will uh, affirm some things on the basis of faith or intuition or whatever you want. So that um, on that note, I will stop and we'll deal with Jesus' baptism uh, next time.